Hey everyone, welcome back to a, a brand new episode of Hero Hero Go Show. I am your host, Bo Ransdell. I am joined uh, for the next uh, three episodes, uh, if you include this one, by Derek Bourgeois in our look at a series of films uh, titled One Miss Call. So Derek, first of all, thank you for being here again. It's a pleasure to be here again, Bo. Excellent. Yeah. Well, eh, don't be so hasty. Um, <laughs> you know, we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, because we're talking about one missed call too. Uh, after the dizzying highs of the last episode of the Takashi Miike classic, one missed call, a movie that since you know really digging into it and watching it again. I've really recommended a bunch more to people recently where I'm like, man, when was the last time you watched one Miss Call? Go watch it again. Trust me. It's so good. Um, and then coming off of that into one Miss Call 2 is a little bit of a bummer. Yeah, especially uh, when you get the title card, that kind of looks like a Pang Brothers Eye sequel. Yeah, I <laughs> right. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, again, we just covered the eye. Um, and yeah, it, it totally looks like that, which is one of the cooler things about the movie. I wish there was more of that and less of everything else. But, uh, so do do you have the arrow edition of these movies? I do. Okay. I do. Did you happen to watch the making of stuff and that kind of thing for one miss call to you? Not yet. I, I, I kind of skipped over it because actually, ironically enough, I started one missed call three out of the curiosity. I'm like, yeah, we'll get into it when we get into it, but I didn't finish that movie yet. But uh, yeah, that was way better what I saw of that movie than this one. Yeah, I I still haven't done that yet because lo and behold, thanks to our listeners, a little, let's just be right up front with this, a little bit of a schedule change. Um, we were going to do one missed call three on the next episode, but somebody actually got us a source for the one miss call television show. Uh, so we're going to do that the next episode, which chronologically is how the release of this went. it's one miss call two that leads to the TV show, which goes to one miss call final. And so that'll be the order of the shows coming up and Derek will be here for all of that. Uh, and then we've got some one-offs uh, on the back end of that stuff, but um yeah so the the television show has been procured it's uh spoilers uh i i really enjoyed the first episode at least and and we'll dig into that in more detail on the uh on the next episode but um the reason i bring up the the arrow edition though and is because there is that making of thing which was produced at the time like by the filmmakers uh, at the time that the movie was made so it's a lot of you know like hey we're gonna interview the actress and it's very like japanese press kind of questions where it's like oh tell me how you know you you got into the part how did you play this character you know that kind of stuff it's real yeah. softball shit um but it's you know it's it's still kind of interesting to see some of that behind the scenes stuff because every time you get a glimpse at a Japanese movie set, it seems like the most polite, wonderful place in the world to be. Where everyone is just constantly like, Arigato, Arigato. You know, like everybody's bowing and thanking everyone after the after every scene. And, you know, the uh in this one you see like their professional cook on set making uh like bento bowls for everybody and shit. It's like, man, I wish I were making a Japanese horror movie. This looks great. And everybody seems so nice. <laughs> uh, like giving flowers to everybody on their last day of, of shooting and stuff. It just seemed adorable. I wish I could be there, Derek. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You just get there and then the girls just throw flowers at you. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It just seems so, so wonderful. And uh, that being said, there's really not that much revealed other than there's one deleted scene that I'll bring up kind I I'll I'll try to remember to bring it up at at the point in the movie when we're talking about it but it's it's weird that they left it out because it sort of explains everything and I was like really you cut this out and you left in a bunch of the other bullshit all right 
Yeah, I feel like the guy who edited Godzilla versus Kong edited this movie. <laughs> right, yeah. You left out all the good stuff. Um it's yeah, it's yeah, that not a not a bad analogy. Um so all right, so let let's jump into it. This, this was a direct sequel of course to One Miss Call. Um I did as much research as I could to give some background uh for this movie. But there's really not much background. It's one missed call made a bunch of money. It was really successful. They wanted to do another one. Takashi Miike was like, nah, I got other shit to do. I got another seven movies to make this year. So, yeah. So. Yeah, you know, the th- the weird thing is, it, you know, this came out in 2005, the same year as the I-3. Yeah. Which, ironically, both films involve people going to a different country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure enough. It, it Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um. <laughs> And th- it, this is directed by Rimpai uh, Sukamoto, who did uh, not a bunch. A lot of television stuff is kind of his bag. Um, couple of features here and there, like steadily working. The guy, you know, is, is working as of 2020. Um, but, you know, I mean, just not a- an auteur or anything like a real kind of journeyman director kind <laughs> kind of guy. Uh, and when you, he introduces the deleted scenes on the desk and, uh-huh. and he seems like to genuinely be a thoughtful director. I don't know that he's a particularly good director, but he seems thoughtful at least where he was talking about like, well, the reason I pulled this scene out is because I felt like we were losing some scares. And so I pulled this bit of exposition out to keep, kind of keep things moving. And again, that's where I'm like, really? You thought things were moving? Okay. Um, Because it seems like you could have taken that extra 60 seconds to explain the plot of the movie, but fair enough. Um, Anyway, so Rinpei uh, Tsukamoto, not particularly notable. Um, There's, uh, as far as actors go, uh, Asaka Sato as uh, Takako Nozoe, uh, the, the reporter has been in a bunch of stuff. Most notably, she was Naomi in Death Note. Um, Uh Uh-huh. And she's awesome in this. Like, she is absolutely the best thing about this movie. Yeah, she's like a... Yeah, she's like the female Carl Kojak, you know? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, and she's just got a real presence. Like, she's very assertive in the movie. And it maybe it's just nice because so many Japanese horror movies, they put the, the female characters in the back seat so much. And yeah. and she is so much in charge and and really driving the narrative of the movie. Yeah, for sure. You know, like when I was watching it on this watch, I'm like noticing like she's overshadowing like the who is supposed to be like the you know the first few characters that we meet are these uh, Kyoko and uh, Nato, and you know she's like way bit more interesting than those two fucking characters in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right when she shows up, it's like, oh, now the movie can start. Great. Um, even though we've theoretically gotten some scares and stuff, but uh, yeah, so that's really it. Like, they, like I said, not a ton of interesting backstory here, um, other than hey, we're trying to expand and extend this one Miss Cole series, right? Like, you know, Juwan did it. Why? Not, why not us? The Ring did it, certainly. Uh, Ring did it on the same day, but Ring was like, fuck you, here's a sequel right now. Yeah, <laughs> Rosin. Right, how about this? Enjoy. Uh, and although Rosin isn't particularly good as far as I'm concerned, but um, one of these days we'll do that whole series. Anywho, uh, let, let's jump into the story of One Missed Call 2, because I at least this takes place in a world where One Missed Call happened. Yeah. You know, like early on, it's it's clear that the characters are at least aware <laughs> that some really fucked up phone stuff happened. And you get uh, right up front. It's like the, the sound of the, the phone ringing. And uh, you do, like you said, get that title in the eyeball. That's very much like the Ping Brothers. Um, and then we're introduced to Kyoko and uh, Madako who are uh, basically kindergarten teachers. Mm-hmm. And 
And Monaco is like, hey, Kyoko, how about we go out for a drink, you know, because we've been dealing with these kids all day. And uh, and Kyoko is finally talked into it, but not before um, there's kind of a creepy moment where it's raining as they're kind of seeing all the kids off at the end of the day. And this swing starts swinging on its own. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty good. And then a little girl named uh, Rika um is being picked up by her mom who looks dead up like a ghost <laughs> yeah like i was like what the hell you know and she's not even wearing like it's poor now and she's just wearing like a you know like the jew the jew on like outfit <laughs> yeah it's i mean we've talked about it a number of times on this show that like japanese shorthand for a ghost whereas in america like you throw a sheet over somebody and say boo that's a ghost well in japan you throw a white dress on somebody and give them kind of that long, dark hair and that pale skin, that's a ghost. And so it's really weird to use that kind of iconography early on because it doesn't ever pay off. It doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, they never go back to it. Yeah, it's it's so frustrating. It, like, right off the bat, you're like, oh, well, what is all this about? This is really intriguing. Like, is there a ghost mother? And maybe... I don't know. But anyway, so Rika is like, oh, every time it rains, that's souls falling to earth. And uh, before she leaves, she's also like, bye, ghost kid in the back. <laughs> and Kyoko's like, the fuck? What, what, what is Rika waving at? And then off goes ghost mom and Rika, never to be seen again in the movie. Um, so Kyoko and uh, Madako go out for drinks, and they're going to... Um, a restaurant that Nato works at, who is Kyoko's boyfriend. And then there's Mei Feng, who is the daughter of the guy who owns the place. That is also a friend of theirs. Mm -hmm. And anyway, they show up uh, there. There's the one miss call uh, uh, call and the dad uh grabs the phone and is like oh is that mayfang's boyfriend i'll i'll show him so he's got her phone and uh spoilers he's gonna get a one missed call call <laughs> for intended for his daughter and he ends up answering it um and then let's see anything else important about this scene oh there's the super special necklace that kyoko is wearing that uh Naruto noto gave her um and that's kind of it i mean it's just uh, sort of establishing all the these characters and stuff. yeah it's kind of like that setup scene from the first movie where you know it sets up you know there's a dinner scene where they're all eating dinner at this restaurant and you know they all get new you know exchange phone numbers because one of them got a new phone same kind of setup as the first movie but then you know they had like that little added twist where the father actually picks up the one missed call yeah and that's kind of you know an intriguing thing and of course it's gonna come up again later in the movie i say of course after just talking about the fact that this ghost mother never shows up again um so maybe you know hey all bets are off uh but yeah so he answers the phone uh he hears uh his daughter saying something to the effect of like i i told you never to leave you know oil sitting on the stove or something like that and they look over it uh Naruto is is there as well and they look over at the stove nothing's on there and the father is like well this, this is weird and then they hear a scream and then in comes Mei Fing and they're like hey you're on the phone and she's like no that's my phone what are you doing with my phone asshole I went out to get <laughs> groceries what are you doing um so yeah so he intercepts the the call that one presumes is from mimiko from the first film you know spooky ringtone and all yeah and uh so at later on they're still at dinner kyoko's talking about how she wants to go into child therapy on account of all the kids they see who are abused which sounds like a real chronic problem in japan yeah especially when you're letting them go off with ghost mothers you know Oh, yeah, willy-nilly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here to pick up my child. 
Oh yeah, can you? It, anyone will do. Apparently, that's right. Uh, my, I lost my daughter in the floods. Now I come here every Tuesday, looking for a baby. Uh, all right. Well, here's one. We got plenty. Um, oh. <laughs> anyway, so, um, w- Mayfing uh is sharing her phone number around so that you know we set up this number getting passed around again very similar to the setup of the first one only uh that one had much more like creepy shit and and stuff in it um so meanwhile uh madoko it all gets the one missed call out front and kyoko is like hey isn't that the ringtone from that television show where that that girl died good callback yeah I, I'm glad they acknowledged it where immediately they're like, hey, wait a second. Remember when that person died on live television a couple of yeah, years ago? Yeah, when her head popped off like a balloon. <laughs> yeah. Like grape. Yeah. It, I Like you said, I, I'm just glad that they they pay some lip service to the fact that this happened. Because I think it would change life forever as soon as that showed up on television. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It's it's probably the best thing that this movie does is acknowledge the first one at least, you know. Yeah. Some yeah, and sometimes a little too much, but whatever. Uh I'm glad to see, you know, scary scenes in a movie like this. Um anyway, so uh after they're like, "Oh my god, that's a girl who died on TV." Meanwhile, uh Naoto goes back into the kitchen where he finds the mr wing the guy who owns the place dead face first in a bunch of rice and uh in comes the detective from the first movie our our favorite character <laughs> from that movie yeah uh, who we learn in this movie is named motomia uh we finally get a name uh for him and he shows up and immediately is checking wing's mouth for red candy uh to see if this is some more you know mimico bullshit he's got to deal with <laughs> it's great yeah you know, red candy <laughs> yeah and they're like no 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 he didn't even have a cell phone and he's like what he didn't have a cell phone huh that's fucked up and so he takes off but this is where we get the introduction of like we said the best character of this movie which is uh takako and uh takako um and she is a reporter hot on the heels of this story about you know people getting phone calls that predict their death and so she's clearly been following this for a while and i like the fact that before they start talking motomia is like hey turn off your recorder and she's like oh okay got me you know (laughs) (laughs) it's good scene i like that yeah and he asks her like hey why are you so obsessed with this story and she has this flashback to you when she was a child with a, a uh, sister hopping around in black and white. And um, we also, during this conversation, get the the bit of information that Yumi Nakamura, the, uh, the one who was possessed by Mimiko at the end of One Missed Call, is still missing. That they yeah. have no idea where she is. Yeah, she's probably on that island in Battle Royale with the little Seth killing people right now. Oh, my God. Yes. (laughs) Uh, With her uh, pots and pans. Yeah. Uh, And then we get uh, a flashback to the end of the first movie to kind of remind us of the knife and all that stuff. And before he leaves, though, Motomiya says, you know, we're we're both trapped in an endless maze, Uh, which I kind of like and 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 like this movie starts pretty strong because you're you've got the big ties to the first movie uh takako is a really cool character and she's like right up front is kind of you know ballsy and in your face and motomi is here like what more could you want out of a sequel honestly i wish this movie was just these two characters trying to figure out what was going on right Yes, you're. Yes, the the movie would be ten times better if it were just these two characters. Um, I wish they had taken your advice, Derek. Yeah. Um. But uh, Naoto ends up uh, calling out for Kyoko, but he ends up getting stopped by our lady reporter, 
uh, uh, Takako, and she is like, hey, I, uh, I think what happened is that this guy got the one missed call instead of Mei Feng. And then she kind of recaps the whole first movie for Naoto. And then she also shows up a picture of Mimiko. And it's like, yeah, this is the ghost that does it. And, uh, and, and Naoto is like, no, nah, nothing's been weird around here lately. Except for, yeah, him, him taking that phone call. I guess that was pretty strange now that I think about it. And that ringtone was one we'd never heard before. So I don't know. Maybe it's a ghost. And he's like, oh, and by the way, this other girl we know, Monaco, her cell phone rang the exact same way. And she's like, are, are you fucking serious? Get, get her on the phone. Call her right now. And so he does, but it's all staticky and like he can't, he can't connect to Monaco. Yeah. The, the ghost block. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, right. The ghost cell phone. I, and the, you actually see like his reception bars fade away as the ghost drains his reception aka gives him a t-mobile service hey i have t-mobile it's not that bad i i i have it too and let's be real um or maybe it's just my ear anyway hey. <laughs> so there's kyoko uh with mei feng who is upset about her father naturally um and kyoko is kind of taking care of him and and monaco is there as well uh, or no, she's calling Kyoko. Monaco is at her place. And she calls Kyoko to kind of check up and see how Mei Feng's doing. And um, Naoto, meanwhile, is trying to get in touch as well. Uh, and while they're on the phone, though, Kyoko sees, like, somebody moving behind Monaco, which is pretty good. And even sees, like, ghost hands on her shoulders and shit. And she's like, you know, Kyoko just throws down her phone on account of it being all haunted and whatnot. And uh, yeah. when she picks it back up, it's all static and like Monica has gone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's good so far. Yeah, right. Totally on track. We we cut over to Monica, who sees that she has missed a call from herself that is going to uh, that came from 601, which is in about five minutes. And she sees herself screaming. And so, uh, Monaco, you know, basically gets chased by this ghost into the shower. Her body starts twisting, sort of like we saw, uh, again in the original One Miss Call, as this ghostly hand is, you know, grabbing her. And, uh, Kyoko is trying to, like, get in to save her after seeing, you know, the ghost on the phone and whatnot. And she busts in in time to see her all twisted up in the shower and uh naoto and and takako find her there as well but now kyoko's phone starts ringing and it's of course the one miss call ringtone and naoto sees that it's of course kyoko's number that's calling kyoko's phone um yeah and you know it's like uh pretzel you know that the whole scene where they discover the pretzel girl in the tub is just okay this movie's doing okay things right now but then what happens happens next yeah it's we are we are in very short order going to kick this movie into neutral for about 45 minutes um because now that we've set this up where like okay monaco is dead kyoko got the call uh, Naoto is there to help save her, and we've got uh, Takako and um, Motomiya as detectives to try to prevent this, right? Like, that's the setup, and if that was, like you said, if that was the whole movie and we introduce a couple more characters to die along the way, bada-bing, bada-boom, totally fine movie. Uh, maybe not reinventing the wheel, but kind of in the, in the wake of one missed call. If you were to do just another one missed call, I'm kind of okay with that. Yeah, you know, like, and it's fucking hilarious when you find out that she has, like, three days or some bullshit. They gave her, like, three days to live, you know, just where, you know, like, wow, this ghost is generous. They usually give the other people, like, a day. Yeah, <laughs> like, Monaco got five minutes, yeah. you know? 
that's some bullshit. Uh, <laughs> and, and as we'll learn later, sometimes it, it just, your time's up, you know? Yeah. You know, like this lady had time to go to Taiwan and shit. <laughs> like, yeah. What? <laughs> Take a vacation, come back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> had time to pick up the pictures. Um, uh, so anywho, uh, Takako then shows Motomiya this picture on the phone of Kyoko standing by a fence that is, like you said, it's a call that's made three days in the future. And Motomiya is telling his junior detective, like, I need you to go find the place where this was filmed. If we can find out where she's going to die, maybe we can prevent it. And I like the fact that his part, his younger partner is just like, what are you talking about? We can't fight a ghost. What what are we gonna do? Arrest it? You know, like well, yeah. So what? We find the place. Who cares? What's that gonna do? Like she's fucked. <laughs> right in front of her. T- yeah. Oh, j- oh, sorry, ma'am, but you're fucked. I I wish I could help you, but I can't. Uh, you're cursed. You know, like I can't uncurse you. No one can. You fucked up. You got a phone call and you're fucked. That's how it goes. Uh, so. But, but, Takoko then goes to find Mimiko's grandmother with Naoto and Kyoko in tow. And the grandmother, by the way, maybe, aside from, you know, Takoko, the, uh, the, or Takako, the, the lady reporter, aside from her, maybe my favorite character is this grandmother that is just from jump is like, Mimiko? You mean that creepy ass kid? She was awful. (laughs) <laughs> if you are you here to tell me that she was a ghost that murdered people totally adds up she was she was a creepy kid from from the start uh, and it turns out that freddy krueger style she was the product of uh a rape but, i was thinking that too when i was watching i was like i wrote that down freddy krueger daughter of a, a maniac yeah yeah the the bastard daughter of a hundred maniacs or whatever um yeah and and so she says that um her her husband at the time caught the rapist red-handed and then stabbed him to death so he went to jail and then when he came out he just went back to his hometown in taiwan and the grandmother, by the way, is like, look, I if you want to go talk to him, fine. But I got to warn you, jail fucked him up. And uh, Takako is like, how did it, how, did it screw with his head or something? And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says uh, that he, he sees this girl all the time, everywhere. And he, and, and that that girl wants to kill him. And Kyoko is like, you know, maybe we should just say a little prayer here for Mimiko because you know she really didn't do anything wrong and this is right and I'm like this is the kind of thinking that got you cursed in the first place she didn't do anything wrong she killed like 40,000 people already right I mean did you not hear the story of the first movie like you saw with your own eyes that she murdered someone on national television and now you're like you know maybe we plus, she was to- abu- plus she was abusing her little sister too like right yeah you know and we, and this is our hero come on kyoko let's l- let's spare you know our our sympathies for someone who truly deserves it not this murderous hell child because uh. we've got another murderous hell child to deal with anyway so uh takako calls the grandfather but he doesn't ever answer so uh she starts getting these pains in her head or we see the first of these where she's having visions of her and her sister and um it's her sister like answering a phone and then it we'll get into the ins and outs of that in a minute because we got an hour's worth of just exposition and farting around to do where <laughs> So after called the grandfather, she doesn't get an answer. She calls her old boy or her old husband. It turns out her ex-husband, Yu Ting, um, who is in Taiwan. And she asks him for help tracking down this grandfather. And he's like, Hey, are you, are you tracking down a story about people who get phone calls from themselves in the future, predicting their death? And she's like, 
is it happening there in Taipei as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, hilariously enough, I actually recognize the actor who plays Yu Tang because he was on a season of Common Rider. Yeah, Peter Ho is his name, and he is yeah, he's one of the funnier things in that making of is that he's of course a native Chinese speaker. And in the movie, he speaks Japanese, but in the outtakes, he is not particularly good at speaking Japanese. No. Uh, so anyway, it's very funny. But the same is true of uh, of Sato, uh, who plays Takako. Um, she does not speak Chinese and is called upon to do that in this movie. And there are outtakes of her fucking that up, too. So um, yeah, it's, it's like when Mike did like a seducey western jango just speak english right Let's do it yeah yeah right it, it kind of doesn't matter and but again if you know mike were at the helm then maybe that's how it would go uh yeah. but uh, you know again this is a very journeyman director that we're dealing with here and, and he's gonna do a very literal interpretation of whatever script he's given it feels like um so at any rate uh, it, it turns out, yet yeah, yes, this is happening elsewhere. Uh, there's a forensics report that comes in on uh, Monaco and and Ta- uh, Takako ends up interrupting the uh, Motomiya being told uh, that there's coal dust in Monaco's stomach that matches the the coal dust also found in the stomach of Mr. Wang, the cook from the restaurant at the beginning of the movie. And Takako says, Hey, check and see if that coal is from Taiwan. Uh, and he's like, why would it be from Taiwan? And she's like, they had similar murders there years before Mimiko ever died. So turns out Mimiko, maybe not our villain. Yeah. This is where the movie's like, What? (laughs) <laughs> right th- yes this is where things start to go off the rails a little bit and so then we're we we go to the next day which is july 19th so we have two more days before kyoko is gonna get got and uh takako ends up finding the the home place of the grandfather and there are knives and cleavers just hung from the the awning outside in a very Texas chainsaw kind of move. Uh, and the place is, you know, just filthy and disorderly. Um, it turns out that there's a shrine inside for Mimiko's mother. Uh, and, and she kind of steps into that space. And then Takako s- starts seeing like people moving just like at the edge of her vision and stuff and ends up exploring deeper into the house where, uh, she finds, after after seeing some ghost arms appearing, uh, the mummified body of the grandfather holding on to a cell phone, which yeah. is kind of hilarious that this old man in Taipei was found with a cell phone in his hand. That's that's really where technology has gone far far too too far. Um. But yes, anyway, it, but it's a pretty good effect. The mummified body looks pretty good. Yeah, it would have been awesomer if it actually got up and moved. Though. <laughs> Man, right. Again, one missed call gives it gives everything to you. Oh, you, you need a, a creepy, drippy Fulci zombie? Here you go. Uh, and this just doesn't have those kind of moves. Um, yeah. So, all right. So Takako and Yu Ting... Uh, kind of hook up at his place and she's like oh you're still wearing the wedding ring like a chump um and he's like well you know technically we're still married we're separated not divorced and it turns out that yuting has a trapper keeper of all the victims of all these one miss call calls and when kyoka or not kyoka when takako starts thumbing through she's like oh my god you're into this too uh it's like she discovered he had velvet underground records or something i'm like oh my god i'm a it, fan it, yeah and you find out his brother is actually the fucking dude from the first movie the deaf photo guy yeah yeah <laughs> uh so 
Right. And there's like a picture of Mimiko in there. Um, and anyway, he, but it, the whole deal with you Ting is he's like, I don't want you to get involved with any of this because it's, it's lethal. Like you're going to get yourself killed investigating this shit. And, um, meanwhile, Takako gets a call from Naoto who's like, Hey, any updates on saving my girlfriend over here now that you're in Taiwan? And uh, Takako tells him, like, hey, by the way, Mimiko got a call from her grandfather, and maybe that's how she got infected with this curse. What? And then, sure enough, forensics, Derek, show that there was coal dust in Mimiko's stomach. So, what? So that Kyoko's caller may not actually be Mimiko, they conclude. Yeah, this movie's getting way off the rails. So, okay, so then Kyoko freaks out because she sees a ghost kid staring at her from inside a suitcase, which is maybe the coolest shot of the movie. And then when Naoto goes to investigate, he finds inside the suitcase uh, a telephone where uh, the, the ringtone that we know uh, plays. And... This time, the image on her phone is this girl standing at this chain link fence, and we see that her mouth is sewn shut. Yeah. This girl's, they're like, this is a different person. They're trying to show you that. (laughs) Right. Like, yeah. So, in very short order here, they're basically like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything that happened in the first one definitely happened. But Mimiko was somehow a victim of this other ghost that is the one that we're chasing in this movie. I, uh, yeah, this is... Yeah, I know. I Right. Like, di- why did Mimiko have a cell phone? Why? <laughs> when I don't think we ever saw that. Why are they trying to victim? They're trying to victimize uh, the killer from the first movie, which I don't like at all. Well, and but that's the other problem is that Mimiko will actually show up later in this movie to kind of rumble a little bit, and you're like, wait a second, or so is she still alive, or you know, is she still an active ghost as well as the other one? Because uh, Mimi, because Mimiko is the one that shows up in the mon with Takako. What what this movie should have been it was it should have been like a, just a copycat ghost, and then Mimiko comes and fights it. Goes, you stole my ringtone, bitch. Man, if this were like you know, uh, was it Sadako versus uh, Kyoko? Uh, yeah. Uh, then yeah, that like that movie is a million times better than this. Yeah, like, it's at least did- entertaining. Yeah, because she was just kind of like, uh-uh, no, you didn't, bitch. You stole my ringtone. You, you, you're trying to copy my moves? Uh-uh, it's time. Takes, I'm taking my nails off. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah. It would. Oh, my God. It would have been so much better. Like, you know, me, Mimiko with her knife, you know, Lily with the needle, fight to the death. Or, yes. you know, the under. Anyway, we'll get to Lily in a minute. Um, so back in Taiwan, Takako gets another headache and Yu Ting is like, oh, are you still, you know, hearing these voices and stuff? And he, apparently he knows about her sister and, um, then, uh, she says, you know, I keep hearing my, my sister saying, stop that hurts. Like the night she disappeared, I, I heard these voices saying, stop that hurts. And then the voice faded away. I felt this moment of pain. And she says, I know for a fact that my sister wasn't just drowned. She was murdered by whoever was on the other end of that phone. The phone, by the way, a a phone that has no cord connected to anything. It's just a, a good old fashioned ghost phone. So I guess the implication is that it was Lily who killed the sister, maybe? It would make sense because the timeline wise, because Mimico wouldn't be a ghost yet if this movie's 
trying to tell us what it's trying to tell us. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like Mimiko is not even born at this point. Uh, so, which is anyway, we'll get, we'll, we'll talk about it. So anyway, um, <laughs> you ting is just like, Hey man, you got to get out of here. Like you really, you, you really need to quit this investigation before you actually get hurt and go back to Japan. And Takako is like, no, I'm going to, I'm saving Kyoko's life. And if you're not going to help me, then get out of my way. And Yuting is like, ah, fine. There's just no point fighting with you. You're, you're headstrong. And I, I should tell you, though, that there's a journalist friend of mine that recently died investigating this. So that's why I want you to get out of here. Um, and anyway, meanwhile, back in Japan, Naoto is deleting numbers out of Kyoko's phone. Uh, then he just, you know, snaps it in half and tosses it. And then there's this weird scene where, like, Kyoko is suddenly very aware of everyone around her being on cell phones. And it seems like the movie kind of stops to be like, oh, yeah, remember when this series was kind of about a fear of technology and that kind of thing? And... Uh, you know and and actually had some subtext and so forth and then it just all sort of culminates in her hearing this girl talking about a ghost with a sewn up mouth that she chases into an alley and and scares the hell out of <laughs> and it, when she's like what so what do you say when when the ghost with the sewn up mouth shows up at your bedside table at night, what do you tell it? What are you supposed to say? And this schoolgirl who j is just being assaulted by Kyoko is like, I don't know. It's just a story. What are you talking about? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know the. It's just uh, I'm having flashbacks when I watched Evil Dead Trap Three with this movie because it's kind of like that same pandering. Yeah. And e Oh God, it's fucking terrible. Uh, so later on that night, Kyoko and Naoto are outside, kind of chit chatting about like, well, what are we gonna do? And they talk about how, like, oh, remember when we when we met and uh, you lost your cell phone and I found it, and who could possibly give a shit about any of this in a one missed call movie? And then she's like, I'm going to go to Japan and I want you, or I'm going to go to Taiwan and I want you to stay here so you don't get hurt. And he's like, fuck that. I, anywhere you go, I'm going. And so now they're both going to Japan. Or to Taiwan, sorry. And so the next day, they make it to Taiwan. And, uh, uh man, I, I know that they're trying to kind of ground all this in, in this relationship between kyoko and naoto and yuting and takako like we're having these parallel relationships and that's supposed to be kind of the big heart of the movie but i just don't care that's not what i'm here for i don't i don't care that they're in love i don't care that they're trying to patch things up you know i don't want them to be totally two-dimensional but i don't want to spend an hour of act two going through their relationship problems and how yeah. they met and everything. Yeah, the thing with this is, is like, because it's like back to back. It's not even like their cut with like kills or anything. It's just it's pretty much the middle of this movie becomes relationship issues, the movie. Yeah, and the middle of One Miss Call is a completely rocking centerpiece with this exorcism on live television that results in a decapitation. And... Like, the first part of this movie feels like a one miss call movie. And then from this point on, from the, from all the relationship stuff on, it feels like a totally different movie. It feels much more in line with something like the Whispering Corridor series, where it's all these, like, romantic entanglements that lead to curses and shit. Um, ugh. Anyway. Ugh, Derek, this, this movie frustrates me so, so much yeah it's like oh, it's like the dracula 3d of movies it, yeah yeah as if that weren't a movie kind of dracula 3d is the dracula 3d of movies 
But this is also the Dracula 3D. Turns out there can be many Dracula 3Ds of movies, Derek. That's what we're learning here. Yeah, but this one doesn't have a giant CGI praying mantis in it, which I kind of wish it did at this point. Better movie if it did. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm telling you, if anything happened in the middle of this movie. Uh, but all right, so speaking of, when Takako shows up to pick up, you know, Kyoko and Naoto from the airport, she's like, hey, we got we to gotta bust out to this, you know, creepy town that disappeared uh and and there's one survivor so we're gonna go find this old lady that survived this you know complete devastation a mysterious uh disappearance of everyone in this village and it there's this old woman that they find just making beads and she has kind of milky white eyes and this kid outside uh where this lady's making beads tells him Oh yeah, yeah. It turns she did that to herself. Uh, the story goes, and so this is uh, her name is Gal, uh, old lady Gal, and uh, they when she realizes that they're there, she runs inside, um, and they have to kind of, you know, convince her to let let them in because she says Lily is coming, Lily is coming, and then when they finally you know get her to get her shit together she tells the story of lily which is this creepy little girl not unlike mimiko who uh people said was always talking to other invisible people and so all the kids of the village would throw rocks at her <laughs> uh like you do and at one point lily is fed up and when one of these kids throws a rock at her and, and bloodies her nose she points at him and says, you're going to die in three days. <laughs> and, but apparently after that, as Gal tells the story, she just kind of went around town and anybody that pissed her off, she was like, three days, you, three days, you, m three days, you cut me off, three days, stepped on my foot, then three days, just kills everybody in town, <laughs> curses them all until... They all the the remaining townspeople drag Lily into this coal mine uh, that is local to the town, and sew her mouth sh uh, mouth shut so she can't curse anybody anymore. And then they sealed up the mine. <laughs> they Harry Wardened her. Yeah, well, but here's the problem: if they did that, then why did the town dry up and disappear? The problem was solved. Like if there were enough people to do to take care of business like this, I feel like there's enough people to keep the town going. Yeah, yeah. Like Freddy Krueger, this little girl, and she was like, "Uh, -uh. right." Like you know, because they say that Gao is the lone survivor. Well, did these just got, people just die of old age then? That's what I'm thinking. I, I mean, I guess so. Maybe it's like, you know, she's the, the last remaining s survivor of the original Hiroshima bombing or something, you know? Any, I anyway, uh, I, I, I just don't understand. Like, the movie over-explains all the stuff I don't care about and under-explains all the stuff I do care about. Yeah. It, it's... Oh. It, all right, so... Outside of Gal's house, Kyoko is like... Hey, me and Naoto are going to go on alone to this mine because, you know, I'm in trouble. He's going to come with me because he ain't going anywhere, but you don't have to participate anymore. And Takako is like, I got to go because I've got this whole thing with my sister. And uh, she tell it gets kind of creepy because she sort of implies that her father like sexually abused her and that she hated her sister and the way she puts is, uh, put, puts it is, I hated her for escaping his hands. And I think, and maybe I'm just a creep because I immediately like, oh, is that sexual abuse as opposed to physical abuse, you know? Yeah, I think it's kind of, I felt that's kind of impolation on this watch too, you know, where, yeah, she was sexually abused maybe. Yeah, anyway, it, like, again, that stuff could be explained slightly better, but 
Takako says she feels like her her sister is calling out to her, and so then she gets a call from Yu Ting, and Takako is like, "Hey, I'm going into the mine, and uh, by the way, Yu Ting also got this one missed call, and his death is scheduled for an hour before Kyoko's, as it happens, but." like takako is like well i can't do anything there and maybe i can stop something here so i'm just gonna hang out at the mine until i don't and so they go to the mine takako is like on the way in again this is some real like equivocational bullshit where she's like yeah you know maybe the town had this waterborne disease and that Lily's real power was being able to tell when someone had it and she wasn't actually cursing anyone <laughs> and it- yeah <laughs> like like where the fuck did that come from you know like she could have just probably said even better and it would have been even more believable Thanos just came and wiped out this town <laughs> right <laughs> you know he is in the search for balance Thanos came and snapped, you know, <laughs> right. It just, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me, but so, um, they are like, I don't know why we're going down this rabbit hole of, well, maybe there was dis- a disease and maybe Mimiko was un- misunderstood. Maybe Lily was misunderstood, but their behavior in this movie is never anything but monstrous. <laughs> It's and so all these people, unless that's the point of the movie, it's just that people are fucking stupid, Derek. They're just slogging the fucking. Just get to the fucking mine shit, you know. Right, like, and finally we're at the mine, but that doesn't mean anything's gonna happen right away. No, because we gotta wander around outside this son of a bitch for a while, and uh, so uh, they they end up splitting up. Takako then gets the one missed call call. But when she answers it, it's Detective Moto Mia who apparently is using that. Well, we'll get to this in a minute. But he's like, hey, we found Yumi Nakamura and she's dead. And it turns out she was evil all along and it was reawakened in her by Mimiko. What? I know. So the call breaks up. And then Takako goes chasing after some figure she sees in the woods. And she checks her watch. Yu Ting's time is almost up. Um, Her flashlight goes out once she's in the mine. And then she goes to her lighter in her pocket. And when she turns on the lighter, there's Mimiko. And then we cut away. And now, Derek, we're in some kind of dream where Takako stops her sister from answering the phone call. You know, it's that same scene again, but before her sister can answer, uh, her sister is Mariko, by the way. So it stops her from answering the phone, apologizes to her. It's like, I'm so sorry I left you on that day uh, and begs for her forgiveness. Her sister kind of hugs her, seems to forgive her, and then she disappears. And Takako wakes up in the mind and her watch is broken. So she don't know how long she's been out. She don't know what time it is. Yeah, that that kind of mirrored uh, the scene from the first movie too, where uh, you know it's like that dream sequence where uh, I forget the main dude from the first movie's name, where he goes and saves Mimico with the inhaler. Yeah, right. It's that kind of thing, um, that sort of redemption thing. But that uh, I feel like the theme is way cleaner there because that whole movie is just about the whole idea of abuse yeah and and being able to break that cycle to be the person that's like no 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 i'm gonna be able to kind of love this person out of that cycle of abuse even though you know the the kind of end of the movie is well he can't you know like it's eh, when you're dealing with ghost curses and stuff eh, sometimes you're just fucked yeah um but and and but in this movie there is you know this kind of recurring idea of abuse and okay so let's I'll, I'll get to it since we're talking about this there's a scene when they're going to the mine that was cut out uh-huh. it's the conversation that they have in the car where they're talking about um you know like 
all all the 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 sister shit and stuff like that. So in that scene, the deleted scene is that they all kind of connect the dots between Mimiko, Lily, Yumi, um that in basically they were all these individual psychic transmitters that the abuse that they suffered beginning with Lily created this sort of psychic network of abused spirits, you know, that they like, they all sort of communicated and fed off one of uh, one another, which made slightly more sense in the grand scheme of things, because then it's like, Oh, well then that's why Lily was kind of using Mimiko's, ringtone and why you see her in the mind that they're kind of all not the same entity but the same kind of energy if that makes sense it's yeah it's kind of like a that, that, that actually does make a little bit more sense i wish that scene was in the movie now <laughs> yes that's what it, when it, that's what i thought when it, when i should so when the, i saw the deleted scene and even rimpe uh sukamoto <laughs> says well, this does explain a lot of things, but I really felt it slowed down the movie. And I was like, what? It explains it. And you could have taken the scene of, hey, remember that time I found your cell phone? You could have taken two minutes out of that scene and put these two minutes back in. And it would have made the movie so much more, at least an interesting idea. So when you do start seeing Mimiko show up alongside Lily, you're like, oh, okay, well, that does make a, a sort of, you know, kind of dream logic, at least, that they're all sort of bouncing off of one another. Yeah, yeah. It, it's mind blown now that I know that I, I have to watch that scene right after we record. This. Yeah, yeah, w definitely watch that scene. I, I think it's the second or third deleted scene that he introduces. But it, like, like I said, he introduces it with, you know, this really does go a long way towards explaining everything. But I just really thought it was just putting the brakes on the movie. Yeah, yeah, this is like that whole like. Yeah, we're going to have a character named Sarah Zauer that's going to be the son of the character from the MonsterVerse movies in the movie as one of the bad guys. But we're just going to make him a side character and delete all the stuff where he has background. Right. Right. Like, <laughs> anyway, it's very frustrating. One, one, Like I said, once you know that, all of the rest of this is so much more frustrating because it makes no sense unless you kind of go along with, with that logic. Anyway. So, um, outside of the mine, Kyoko and Naoto hear uh, Takako screaming. Naoto goes inside to investigate. Um, meanwhile, Takako can't seem to get Yuting on the phone. And we cut over to him. And he's kind of doing the at least interesting scientific thing of holding a video camera and he's like, hey, if death comes for me, I'm at least going to record it. So maybe it'll save somebody else. Uh, which yeah. I like. I like that move. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of fun. And uh, again, one miss call stuff is fun. I wish that this movie did more of that. Yeah. And uh, so he has his uh, the camera in one hand. He's waiting for death. His phone is ringing with a call from himself, of course. And then we cut back to the mines where Kyoko has gotten bored waiting for Naoto, who's gone into the mines. So now she goes into the mines, searching for him, who she hears kind of distantly. And so she starts hearing some voices and, um, and is investigating. And then she discovers the well from the ring. <laughs> Where where inside there's a bag from audition wiggling around, so you know combining the best of all worlds really, and uh, and actually this is probably the most like genuinely creepy moment in the 